Welcome to today's webinar on monitoring orders, submitting changes, and PO modifications. We're glad you all are able to join us to learn more about this important topic. Before we begin, I would like to review a couple of housekeeping notes for today's webinar platform. We will be taking questions during the presentation between our speakers today as well as at the end. So when we reach those moments, the operator will provide you instructions on how you can ask your questions over the phone. Also, at the end of the presentation, on your screen you'll see a downloadable file section where you can download the slides from today's presentation along with a certificate of completion documenting your participation for training purposes. Also at the end, be on the lookout for a set of polling questions to evaluate today's webinar. We always appreciate your feedback on these events and learning how we can improve to meet your needs. And speaking of polling questions, we'll also have a couple sprinkled throughout the presentation. And I'd like to start with two now to get a better idea of who our audience is today. So our question is, in which region are you located? Are you in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, Midwest, Mountain Plains, or Southwest, or Western? So it looks like we have people today joining us from all throughout the country, with the most being from Mid-Atlantic at about 24%, followed close behind by Southwest at 22%. So we're glad that all of you are here today joining us on the webinar, and we hope you will all learn new things for your work. And now on to our second polling question. How long have you been working with the USDA Foods Program? Less than one year, one to three years, three to five years, or more than five years? And it looks like the answer with the most responses was more than five years, with a little over half of you having that amount of experience with the program. But we also have some newer staff on the line with us as well. So thank you for participating in our polling questions. It's great to know a little bit more about who we have joining us today. And now I'll turn the webinar over to Danielle Lyons, who will provide an overview and introduce our speakers. Thank you, Lindsay, and welcome to the webinar on order monitoring, submitting changes, and purchase order modifications. Today, there will be three speakers, myself, Danielle Lyons, and Roland Barnes with Food Nutrition Service, and David Munford has joined us from our purchasing office, the Agricultural Marketing Service. This presentation will focus on monitoring orders after they've been submitted to USDA, submitting change requests, and the steps required in a purchase order modification. Once again, I want to remind remind you that we'll be stopping after each section to take questions. And now we're going to turn it over to Roland, who's going to begin with order monitoring. Good afternoon. I'm going to go over monitoring orders. It is a good idea to review the catalog to see what products are available and when the orders are due periodically. Orders should be spread out throughout the school year or the date range available in the catalog. Refrain from ordering all products in the first available delivery date and or the first half of the month. Verify that all orders equal full truckload quantity as listed on the domestic order entry screen. Check that each of the split shipment destinations meet the quarter truckload minimum requirement and the group number is applied correctly to each order. Confirm that the date of the contracted warehouses Match when the product has been requested. Reviewing the active destinations and web SDM to verify accuracy is always a good idea. We will discuss this in detail later. Because the process of order monitoring doesn't stop with orders being submitted to USDA, we want to give some guidance as the order status has different direct reflection on entitlement. Here you'll see a screenshot of the order status report. The order status report provides details on the orders throughout their cycle. This report is updated in real time, meaning any changes or update is reflected immediately on the report. For example, if you ask a specialist to change a order 
and receive an email from the specialist that it has been completed, you should run the order status report to see the change reflected. This report is excellent for monitoring the cycle of orders. This report can also help determine what orders still need to have a receipt entered or orders that have been left behind through oversight or USDA processing error. Here at FNS, we always recommend that the report be ran wide open. This is to help catch any mistakes, for example, incorrect destination, wrong product, or program. Note, if you have a secondary state system that uploads to Web SAM, this report should always be ran and checked after an upload to ensure all information is correct. Here you'll see the typical sales order cycle. While there are several order statuses, this shows the most basic and regular cycle of an order in a perfect world. Believe it or not, this happens more often than not. Now let's review the status codes in detail and review the exceptions. Here's a list of all the statuses and their definitions. Approved by SDA. These are sales orders sent to FNS by the SDA. It means it is ready to be approved and filled. Next is approved by sponsor and agency. These are sales orders provided by FNS sent to procurement at AMS. Next, on invitation. These are sales orders placed on solicitation by AMS Commodity Procurement and published. Next is purchase. These are sales orders on contract. There is a purchase order, PO, and the supply and vendor name associated with these sales orders. Orders received. These are sales orders that have been received and receipted for in Web SEM. Returned by FSA AMS. These are sales orders sent back to FNS for changes or edits, modifications or changes to an approved order or for cancellation. And last, resubmit to FSA are sales orders sent back to AMS for processing. The next slide is order cycle monitoring tips. Please help us monitor your orders. You can be a safety net to catch orders that fall in the cracks and may have been left behind, which rarely happens, but there is an occasional oversight or USDA processing error. As a general rule, Here's what states should be aware of. Orders and approved by sponsor and agency usually happens around six to eight weeks prior to delivery. Purchase, orders on contract, sales orders should be on PO at least four weeks prior to the delivery. Most are awarded six weeks prior to delivery. For an example, all July and August orders should be in purchase status as of today, June 21st. Products purchased quarterly should be in purchase status for July through September deliveries. If they are not, you should have been contacted by the FNS specialist as to the status. If you have not been told about a procurement issue in an email or quarterly call, please bring sale order, sales orders in the wrong status to the FNS specialist's attention. Monitoring order and resources. It is a good habit to review the catalog to see what products are available and when the orders are due periodically. Because the process of order monitoring doesn't stop with orders being submitted to USDA, we want to give some guidance as to the order status has direct reflection on entitlement. Please see the, purpose, the calendar handout provided. This is a general month-to-month -month guidance about basic order management catalog processing and entitlement monitoring. As you can see, in, state, in, in June, states are monitoring two school years at once. Have all June 1st through 15th orders been received? Has ASN been issued and all vendors calling for appointments for June 16th through 30th? Are all July orders purchased and potentially August orders? Orders for October through December have been entered. I think you get the idea. We hope these tools are helpful to understand the order. Ship to party process. 
A SHIP-2 priority ID must be assigned to all orders. The SHIP-2 provides delivery information, warehouse address, email, and contact information for ASNs and appointments. SHIP-2 priority review. A SHIP-2 priority review is requested by FNS at least once a year prior to the start of ordering for a new school year. But please do not wait if you have a change. Up-to-date plant, warehouse address, and contact information for appointments is critical to USDA food delivery process. To obtain a SHIP-2 party ID for a new destination, please contact the WebSCM SHIP-2 help desk at the email provided. Please provide them plant or warehouse related information. Include the state distribution agency and receipt agencies you need to provide the warehouse name as well. You also need to provide the plant or warehouse address, including street address, city, state, and zip code, and the plant or warehouse contact number, fax number, and email address. To inactivate a plant or warehouse no longer used, also contact the WebSCM SHIP-2 help desk. Provide them the SHIP-2 party that needs to be inactivated. Again, please be aware of warehouse capacity and timing of contract renewal as well as terms for the contract, termination must be allowed 60 days. And now we have our first polling question. When is it best to request a sales order change? A, approved by SDA status. B, received status. C, on invitation status. Or D, all of the above. And it looks like most of you selected A, about 82% voted for that answer. The answer is A. The best time to request a sales order change is an approved by SBA status. At this point, there is no contract and changes can be done by FNS. Our next polling question. True or false, after the bid analysis is complete and the award of the contract is finished, the order status is changed to purchase status, true or false? About 94% of you selected answer A, true. And that is correct. After bid analysis and award the status is purchased, any sales order changes need, needed will be needed at contract mod due from this point. And now we'll hear from Danielle Lyons on submitting changes. Thanks. After orders are submitted to USDA, the process of reviewing orders doesn't stop there. Bet you have heard us say that about four times already. Help us help you. That's the point we're trying to get across. Double check to verify orders in WebSCM are in the appropriate status and that they are still accurate. If you realize at any point a change needs to be made to an order already submitted to USDA, don't panic. Roland's already described in detail step one. Knowing the status of the order or orders that need to be changed makes a difference in the following steps. When it's time for a change, is there time for that change? The best time for all order changes is when the orders are in approved by SDA status. This includes destination, delivery period, canceling orders, quantity changes, and program changes as well. An FNS specialist can allow changes to sales orders up to the sales order status being changed to approve by sponsoring agency. Once a sales order has been approved in WebSCM, they are released to AMS. AMS will then put the orders on a solicitation to be purchased. While changes can still be made as orders go throughout the order cycle, the complexity for these changes increases. Keep in mind, the best time to make any changes to an order is while they are still in approved by SDA status. Let's review again. Orders, um, after the orders have been reviewed by the FNS specialist, they get approved and then sent over for the solicitation process. With each step in the order cycle, there are fewer changes to the orders that can be allowed, as well as the internal process becomes increasingly more challenging. Changes to orders in approved by sponsoring agency status depends on where AMS is in their process as if the change can be made right away to avoid a purchase order modification. However, it never hurts to contact, contact us as soon as you're aware of a change being needed and ask. When the order status changes to on invitation status, no changes can be made. 
If an order needs to be canceled, notify the FNS specialist immediately, and they will communicate this information to AMS. Depending on where AMS is in their award process, this may or may not be an option. Should AMS be able to accommodate the request, then the order will not change to cancel status until after the award is complete. When the sales order change, when the sales order status changes to purchase, it means that the order has been placed on a contract. Contracts are legally binding documents, and we should try to avoid any contract modifications if possible. The two most common types of changes once in purchase status is a destination change or a delivery date change. Never hurt to reach out to the awarded vendor to request an early delivery date. Keep in mind that they are not required to accommodate early delivery requests. Essentially, both parties must agree to the earlier date. Often, vendors will contact a warehouse and request an early delivery date. Likewise, you and your warehouse are not required to accept deliveries prior to the delivery window. No modification to the contract is required for an early delivery. Keep in mind, both the receiver and the vendor must mutually agree to the earlier delivery date. When there is a justified and documentable cause by the state, the NLT extension can be granted to the vendor for a late delivery. Now diving deeper into the process of destination change requests. I might sound like a broken record, however, I'll say it again. The best time to make any changes to orders is while they're still in approved by FDA status. Ideally, we need to know as soon as you are aware of a change is required. Contract modification requests must be submitted to FNS at least 35 days prior to the first day in the delivery period and at least 45 days to the first day in the delivery period for all IDIQ materials. If these timeframes are difficult to remember or figuring out whether it is or isn't an IDIQ material, just remember 45 days. This would cover both IDIQ and non-IDIQ materials. Please don't send us them monthly. If you know the warehouse has changed, then run a report in WebSCM and determine all orders that need to be changed. David will cover the complexity of a PO modification later. So you've run the order status report and noticed that a change to an order is needed, but the order is in purchase status. The next step is to verify if the order is 35 days prior to the first delivery, first day of the delivery period, unless an IDIQ material, then it's 45 days. And now, now how do you submit that change to FNS? The old process was to send an email in any format with random information to a specialist asking for the change. A sample of one of those emails is on the screen, received by Lene while I was creating this presentation. In this e example, a very minimal amount of information has been provided. Just imagine if only one number had a typo. By defining the modification request process, we will enhance the communication and faster turnaround on all change requests. Here is where the process is going to change slightly. We are requesting that an order status report be submitted in the following format. When a change is needed, any, when a change is needed to any sales order, regardless of the status. There's no need to panic or you can put your pencils down. You don't have to write down all of these um, new requirements. The systems branch has set up the format in WebSCM and it will be released in the next um, update and that will happen later this month. Let me show you how to get to this report. As mentioned earlier, a common report used for monitoring orders is the order status report. Remember that this is a real-time report and that it should be run at the same time the request is being submitted to have the most up-to-date information. In WebSCM, click on the Reports tab, followed by the Order Processing tab, and then close to halfway down the list, click on Order Status Report. The next step is to enter the sales order number in the order number field for the order that needs to be modified. Should several orders need to be modified, all the orders can be entered by clicking on the yellow arrow to the right of the order number field outlined in blue on the screen. 
You'll then receive the following pop-up where more orders can be added. Another option is to copy the orders from another file and paste them into this screen, such as Excel. Once all orders have been entered, click OK. And then this will bring you back to the prior screen where you can click Execute because all of your orders have been entered into the order number field. So the report defaults to the view of order status unless you have specified otherwise at another time. Click on the drop down beside the view to find the new order change report. Select the preset up view format SO SDA modification request. Remember, this isn't going to be available until later this month. So if you try to do this directly after this webinar, you're not going to see it in there. This view of the OS uh, the order status report highlighted um, is in blue on the screen. This is what we will use, be using from this point forward to send in any sales order change requests. The next step is to export the file into Excel by clicking on export. The report will then download into Excel where it's simpler to review results and filter. Remember item numbers. Filter out any orders that do not need a change. Once you have all the sales orders in Excel the, and also in the SO SDA modification request format, add a simple note to the right side of the order as to the change needed, such as the new delivery period. Write the word cancel if you want to cancel that order. Um, if you need a quantity change, put in the new quantity that's needed or even if you need a program change, indicate the new program. For destination changes, we are asking that on the right side, you add three columns, new ship to, new street address, and the new city state. When sending in change requests, have all affected sales orders in one report based upon the FNS specialist who will be processing the request per the contact list. Should you be submitting a request for more than 20 changes, at one given time, please submit the request to the branch chief and include the specialist as well. We want all requested changes to be submitted in the format preset on the order status report and all info changed to the right of the report. We want there to be consistency from this point forward. So you're going to run the report, export it into Excel, in the SO SDA modification request format. To the right-hand side, you're either going to add the note of what you want to change or you're going to add the three new columns. This is a new process and it will be included in the SDA SOPs that will be sent out in the near future, as well as this presentation will be published online should you need to review. I can also be contacted directly with any questions on the process. Brings us to our next polling question. True or false? If you know the warehouse changes, should you should wait until the end of the month the orders are due to deliver before letting the FNS specialist know. And we show about 98% of you selected answer B, false. That's correct. The answer is false. As soon as you know of a change that needs to be made, you need to contact the FNS specialist. And our next question is, how many days prior to the first day in the delivery period should you changes be made for IDIQ materials? And on this question, the most popular answer was C, 45 days, with about 91% of you selecting that option. So the answer is C, 45 days prior to the first day in the delivery period for IDIQ materials. Before we move on, I wanted to stop and open the line for questions on either Roland section or um, the material that I just covered. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then zero on your phone. You will hear acknowledgement tone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up the headset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then zero at this time. If you wish to remove yourself from queue, please press the pound key. And one moment for the first question. And there are no questions on the phone lines. Please go ahead. Okay. At this time, I will turn it over to our guest speaker from the Agricultural Marketing Service, David Munford, to walk us through the modification process. Good afternoon. Thank you, Danielle. So I'm going to talk about contract modifications and how they're processed at AMS to give everyone a little bit of insight on what we have to do to modify a contract. So starting with uh, my first slide, what are contract modifications? In simplest terms, uh, modification is a change to the terms and conditions of a contract. As Danielle and Roland pointed out, contracts are legally binding documents, so modifications become part of the contract and they are also legally binding documents. The Federal Acquisition Regulation, otherwise known as the FAR, sets out the rules and regulations related to modifications. Um, if any of you are unfamiliar with the FAR, it is basically a gigantic book which uh, is the do's and don'ts for all federal procurement. And uh, it's a great cure for insomnia. <laughs> Anyone? I paid that trip last. So uh, this is a little joke. Uh, <laughs> um, one, one uh, piece of trivia, but fun fact here, uh, this third note on the slide, is that a modification is not the same as an amendment. This is, um, these terms are, are often used interchangeably, but um, an amendment is something that you change, is a change to a solicitation. A modification is a change to a contract. A lot of times when people who aren't in the contracting realm use these terms interchangeably, we, we know what you're talking about, but it, it irks us a little. No. Um, so just, just remember that. All right, so moving forward, um, a lot of uh, people that aren't involved in the contracting realm mistakenly believe that the government can just do anything it wants with a contract. That's actually very far from the truth. The government, as a party to a contract, has very specific guidelines about how it can change a contract and what it can change. And uh, in general, there are two types of authority that we, can, we use to change a contract or to modify a contract. The first is a unilateral authority, which is authority given to us by the contract itself. Terms and conditions are written into the contract to allow us to change certain parameters without the approval of the second party or the contractor. These types of changes are usually administrative in nature and do not have a direct impact on the performance of the contract, such as the delivery destination, the delivery date, or the price or cost of the contract. To change uh, those, those elements, uh, it typically falls under, a, it's typically going to be a bilateral type of authority, otherwise known as a supplemental agreement. If we change something that affects the terms and conditions of the contract and they have a, d a direct impact on the pricing or performance of the contract, we need to get the vendor to agree to that. So a good example um, of, of a bilateral change, uh, when you talk about, which we're going to get into destination changes in a, little more, in a little bit more detail, but if we ask a vendor to go from Cleveland to Cincinnati, that's a significant difference, a significant distance away. So the, the vendor has contracted a firm fixed price with us to deliver to Cincinnati. They have the right to renegotiate a price to us to take it to Cleveland. So that would be a bilateral modification, something that they have to agree to up front. So there's a lot of things that come into play when we make a change like that. Well, some of the common modifications that we do at AMS for our FNS customers are discount modifications. Uh, which typically are done when a vendor's product fails to meet a specification. Uh, the vendor can request a waiver of the USDA specification to allow shipment of the product. Typically, these are subject to a dollar discount, a reduction in the price of the item, and we approve these typically in coordination with FNS because we 
don't want to send you the customer something that you don't want or that you cannot use. Sometimes receiving a product that deviates from the specification is better than not receiving a product at all, however. Another common modification we do are no later than extensions. Now these typically occur at the request of the vendor. Um, excusable delays. In the real world, we have tractor trailer trucks going all over the country every day. There are things like weather, uh, traffic incidents, um, things like that um, that can potentially delay these shipments. Um, harvest issues, crop issues, issues getting grading and inspection. So we have uh, things built into our contracts that charge vendors, late fees and things like that. But we do, we, we do a lot of no later than extensions um, for excusable delays. And these require a lot of communication between us, AMS, the vendor, and FNS, and you. Um, because we want you to be aware of when you're getting your materials, especially if they're not coming when they're supposed to. Destination changes, which Danielle touched on a little bit, are very common mods. Um, these are initiated by FNS, and they come to <clears throat> they come to, to us. They can be either bilateral or unilateral, depending on the type of the contract. And we will talk a little bit more about destination changes in a moment, since those are uh, the ones that we do for FNS. But we, we do some other less common modifications. Uh, we sometimes add or cancel orders from purchase orders. Um, as uh, Roland and Danielle mentioned, sometimes this, uh, you, the states have determined that they can't use a product. If it's early enough uh, after PO award, we can often cancel those orders without much difficulty. It just kind of depends changing the quantities of orders, substituting one product for another, uh, adding authorized plants or shipping points, or possibly even terminations. Um, it's not uncommon in the real world to have to change contracts many times um, to adjust and adapt to the changing environment. So talk a little bit more about destination changes. Danielle mentioned that there are uh, minimum days notice uh, to, to submit changes to FNS, 35 days for non-IDIQ and 45 days for IDIQ orders. I'd like to just kind of delve into that. We require a minimum of 30 days notice from FNS prior to the first day of delivery to process those destination change modifications. And there's a very good reason for that. There's a lot going on before that truck leaves the warehouse. The vendor is basically already performing on that order weeks in advance. They have packed, uh, labeled, and, and placed the, and palletized the product. They have USDA inspectors in the regional offices all over the country who have to travel in many cases to the facilities. These are paid services by the vendor, um, including hotel and airfare to get SEI inspectors out to grade and inspect their, their products in accordance with the contract. And then finally, there's check loading, scheduling of transportation with trucking companies. All of this is going on in the weeks before the truck ever rolls out to your warehouse. So 30 days notice is really the minimum amount of time that we need to let the vendor know that we are moving the destination, that we would like to move the destination. Once you get beyond that, the vendor is then going to have the right contractually to start renegotiating prices or refusing to move it. Uh, costs can change with destination changes. They can increase or decrease. Uh, if we're sending a truck a shorter distance, we would expect to see a decline in price. And those determinations are also subject to fair and reasonable uh, a determination of whether or not the cost is sufficient. If you, so if you request a destination change to have something moved from Cleveland to Cincinnati, there's an evaluation that's going to happen. If they want to, ch they can add $5 a case to their purchase or to the price of the product to move it 200 miles. We need to evaluate those things and determine if it's in the best interest of the taxpayer and the government and you all to make those changes. I'd, I do have a note here that says special or extraordinary situations. As you know, in the real world, things are going to happen 
we try to be as flexible as possible and to accommodate uh, these unusual situations and be, and, and be flexible. Um, in, the, in this realm, anything that can go wrong seems to go wrong, and we try to adapt to that and, and be ready. So just wanted to put that out there. Next slide, destination changes. I think um, you're sort of getting the point here that being proactive is, is very helpful and is really a key to success. Um, for example, if you have a warehouse contract that's coming to an end and you have a new warehouse contract and you know that there are a large number of orders that are going to need destination changes, it's best to get those all over to us as early as possible and to consolidate them. That way we can, mo we can, modify, we can modify maybe 10 orders on the same purchase order. And it's a, it results in a fewer number of modifications and a lot less of an administrative burden. It also can reduce poten the potential for reimbursements for storage, transportation, grading and inspection, things like that. So back to my example about um, a destination change where we're sending a product from Cleveland to Cincinnati or Cincinnati to Cleveland, whatever I said. Uh, if we were to send a destination change to a vendor while that truck was already on the road and divert that truck um, or, or cause that truck to be held up, well, as everyone knows, time is money. The vendor, we have then changed the terms and conditions of a contract, uh, and, and the vendor then has the right to come back to us and request uh, reimbursements for things like storage, um, a diversion, additional gas mileage, additional uh, truck driver hours, things like that. So just be proactive. That is a, that's a tremendous help for, to us. The actual processes that we use to change a, a, a purchase order or a contract, there's a lot going on in the background. Communication between you, between FNS, between the various uh, state agencies and stakeholders on your side. You have all that going on. At the same time, we're communicating with the vendor. We're often communicating with specialty crop inspection or the other um, AMS technical offices. We're sometimes having to communicate with our budget office. We're communicating with the nutritionist. It's a lot of communication going on. And that in itself, has, we have to build in time for. We have processes in WebSCM. We have to actually go in to make this uh, purchase order modification effective. We have to go in and we have to click all the buttons and draft up the legal document, the SF30 contract modification. Um, we need to get it out to the vendor, give them time to review it. Sometimes the vendors want to send these things to their legal department. Sometimes they have a bottleneck and everything has to be signed by the CEO. Uh, we have to get that document before it's finalized, signed by the vendor, and then finally everything gets uploaded in WebSCM and all the, we cross our T's and dot our I's and everything's official. So hopefully that will give you some insight into why it can take a little bit of time to, to modify a contract. So that brings us to uh, the next polling question. The question is, which are valid reasons to submit a contract modification? A, warehouse closures. B, capacity issues. C, warehouse relocation. D, state no longer wants the commodity. E, all of the above. F, A, B, and C are correct or G, A and C are correct. So this one is a pretty close question with 40% of you selecting F, that A, B, and C are correct, followed closely by 38% of you indicating answer G, that A and C are correct. And the correct answer is G, A and C are correct. Warehouse closures and warehouse relocation are the most valid reasons to, modif to request a contract modification.
The second polling question that I have for you is, what are the minimum number of steps required to do a contract modification? A, 1, B, 3, C, 5, or D, at least 8? And just over half of you are selecting answer D, at least 8, followed by about a quarter of you thinking the answer is C, 5. So the correct answer is D, at least 8. And we, what we really are trying to communicate here is that there are a lot of things going on. It's, it's never just a matter of saying, hey, AMS, change this PO real quick. Uh, there's a lot of things going on, there's a lot of communication going on, there's paperwork going on, there's sometimes back and forth negotiations with vendors going on, but the bottom line is um, these are the necessary le steps to make these changes legal, to keep everyone out of court, and get your stuff where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there. So thank you for, uh, for your time. I'm going to go ahead now and turn it back over to Danielle. Thanks, David. So tracking modification requests, we're basically asking you to um, help us help you track and follow up on all contract modification requests, no matter what the um, status of the order. So we want you to follow it through. Check the sales order status um, for completion. Should you not get an email back from your FNS specialist, um, verify on that order status report that it has been done. Um, send an email to us, question us, make sure that your um, request has been followed through all the way through completion that the change has been made. Um, why follow up? We're basically needing to follow up for the traceability. We want to make sure that the, we know exactly where the product has been delivered in the event of a recall. So I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper and kind of give the high level process of a modification that David just talked about and explain the steps um, or go through the steps one more time just so that you can see and understand the complexity of a modification and why we need this new format um, so that we're not just getting an email in that says, can you change the sales order to around the corner? Um, the first step is the stator processor will send the request into FNS using the new format um, that will be in WebSCM later this month. Um, step two is FNS will review and then send the modification request over to AMS. We are checking to make sure that it is sent in at least 35 days prior to the first day of that delivery period or 45 days if we're talking about an IDIQ material. AMS will determine if the contract or the vendor is able to approve or deny the request. Um, if AMS approves it, AMS will return the orders to FNS. Um, AMS will notify FNS that they've returned it. There's no notification that happens automatic in WebFCM for us. There's a lot of email communication going on. And just like all of you, we're getting hundreds of emails a day. So we've got to watch out for those emails, and that's why we need you to also be monitoring the report to make sure that these changes are getting done. Once um, FNS has received that email, we'll go into WebFCM. We will make the change that has been requested, and then we will resubmit the order back to AMS. FNS will then notify um, AMS via email again that the modification has been made. And AMS will finalize the process um, by doing those SF30s as legal documents, talking to the vendors, making sure the vendors are talking to the inspectors, making sure that um, everything is coming together so that that order um, can get to the correct destination. So as you can see, there's a lot of steps. And lastly, we, FNS, will send a um, notification to the state that the modification has been completed. And that will conclude our presentation today. And we wanted to open the line again for any questions on um, today's content. If there are any additional questions, please press star then zero on your touch tone phone. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then zero on your touch tone phone. And one moment for the first question. We are collecting names. Mike Berkmeyer, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. 
Um, I actually have a couple questions. My first one is, when will the states know the forms available in Web Supply? So as soon as that um, form is available, it will be later this month, there will be a release sent out. Um, I can also send an email out um, to our listserv that it is available and when we expect you to start using that new um, form, um, as well as on the next quarterly call, we will also um, remind everyone to start, anyone who has not participated in this WebEx, um, we will also remind everyone that we are expecting everyone to use the new format. Okay, my second question is, is the gentleman from AMS still on the call? Yes. That if vendors have everything ready to go and ship 30 to 35 days in advance, how come we can't get notified of late deliveries that far in advance? They're not, they're not actually ready to ship 30 to 35 days in advance. That's when they're doing the preparation to ship. They may not be ready to ship until the day it, le it leaves the, the warehouse. Right, but at that time, they should know if it's going to be on time or not. Correct. Possibly. It, it, it just seems like it doesn't – We, you say they need that lead time, yet we're not getting that notification if things are going to be um, late. And then my other question is um, capacity issues, why is not that a reason to change – uh, contracts, because that seems how we do a lot of delivery locations for process loads because of capacity issues at processors. Hey, um, Mike, this is Peggy. Hey, Peg. And um, the capacity issues would be related to the processor. Typically, the FNS headquarters works with them and lining up the sales orders going to the processor based on their capacity. When it comes to capacity at state warehouses, we're counting on you all to hopefully place your orders in a manner in which you can receive them. And when we need to change the delivery date on a sales order because, for example, we could not buy a product, you all would look at your inbound deliveries for a warehouse and anticipate it and, and tell us that, you know, I have a capacity issue and plan for it. So ideally, with good planning and continual review or your receiving organization reviewing the inbound deliveries, you could anticipate the capacity issues and change the sales order destination before it's bought. That's why capacity issues are things that can be anticipated and planned for. Um, and again, FNS specialists should be working with the processor to avoid exceeding their capacity. Did, did that answer it? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. If there are any additional questions, please press star then zero. If the operator has already collected your name and you still would like to ask your question, please press star then one. And then we have a Question from the line of Kyra Kears. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. It's Kara Kears. I'm with Florida. Um, I just had a couple of questions. I was wondering, can the state request an NLT date extension? So a state can request an NLT date extension if there is a valid reason and is documentable. Once it's put on contract, we really want to avoid any PO modifications that we can. You need to anticipate that um, um, truck that you've requested coming into your facility and not extend it just because, well, I've decided that I don't want it in August, I want it in November. Just to supplement that information, uh, the vendors are typically pretty flexible when it comes to extending delivery. However, they have the same logistical issues that you all have in terms of storing truckloads of, of, of of a product for an additional weeks or months that they didn't plan on storing. The other thing is that we have grading and inspection certificates which expire at certain times. They want to gener they generally are putting this uh, material into production with pretty short time frames and they, they want to get it out to you and when it's fresh. So having something sit for three months isn't always a good idea, um, but uh, there is some flexibility there. Okay. Well, thank you. 
Um, also, I have another question. Will FNS let the states know when the new WebSEM report for changes is in WebSEM? Yes, I will be sending a message out to everyone when we expect you to start using that new format. Thank you. Oh. Oh, oh here we have a question that was written in. So if it's just going down the road, do we still need a PO mod if there's no freight charges involved? Absolutely. We definitely need to know exactly where that project is going for traceability reasons. We need to know if it is right around the corner, even if it's the same facility but a new address. Anytime there is a change in address, we need to do a PO modification. Yes, and again, to supplement Danielle, uh, they tend to be a lot more simple, um, just um, which is logical. If you're just changing the address, the vendors are almost always going to accommodate that without any issues, and it is a much it is a very simple process. Simple, but still includes a lot of steps. <laughs> yeah. At least eight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but if you can think about it from the real world, you know, it, it's the difference for the vendor and the truck driver is you're taking a right instead of a left. <laughs> There's not a lot to it. And we still have a few minutes left for questions, but just wanted to let you all know that the evaluation survey is now up on the screen. So before you log out of Adobe Connect, please take a moment to share your thoughts. Also, in the bottom right of your screen is a downloadable file section where you can download the slide presentation from today's webinar, along with a certificate of completion, documenting your attendance, and additionally, the USDA Food Perpetual Calendar that was also emailed out this morning, which may be a handy resource for you. So thanks for joining the webinar. And operator, do we have any more questions on the line? And there are no more further questions on the phone lines. I just had one thing to add since we sent out that handout that can be located on the partner web. If you all have any comments or questions about that handout, would you please let me know and we can update or clarify the calendar. It's a new tool and it shows how to go through the whole school year, order monitoring, when order changes are due, entitlement things and processing also. And I would appreciate receiving some comments or questions on that if we can make it better if there's anything that's confusing. If anyone didn't know that was Peggy Cantfield, she didn't announce herself. Oh. But I'm sure that <laughs> most people know that that is that was. That voice. Sorry. Well, thank you all today for joining us on the webinar to learn more about the new process for state agency order monitoring changes in PO modifications. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on the USDA Food and Nutrition Service YouTube channel in the near future. You can find it in the food distribution playlist if you'd like to review today's information or share it with any of your colleagues who are unable to attend. Thank you again for joining us and have a great afternoon. That does conclude our conference call for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T as a teleconference. You may now disconnect.